So, hello and welcome to this pre-recorded PRCA Public Services event. I'm Marcus Crisosimo, I'm Chair of the PRCA Public Sector Group, and I'm delighted to be joined by Assistant Chief Executive of South Northampton Council, who I'll introduce in a moment. Today we're going to be speaking about some of the challenges facing public sector communications. So our topic for discussion is the challenge of comms pros breaking through the glass ceiling to reach senior management positions. And this is also across the wider disciplines in PR. So I've got Peter Holt with me, uh, who I've just said is the Assistant Chief Executive of South North, North Ants Council, who's got wide experience in the public sector um, on both sides of the fence, uh, both as a politician and as a PR practitioner. Um, now made it to Assistant Chief Exec, which is great news for us. PR pros have been working in the industry for a long time. Um, so I just want to say hello to you, Peter, and, uh, and, and basically kick off by saying, um, so, you know, your career, um, you know, so you've got to point here. And, um, you know, we've been chatting about issues across the industry about how you kind of get to the place you get into a chief exec. Um, but clearly there's there's probably lots of challenges for people in this in this industry. So can you kind of tell me about what you think are the challenges faced by ambitious, talented PR people reaching it, getting to the top like you you have? Well, thanks for having me, Marcus. Uh, this is a conversation I've been having with friends for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Uh, you, you get to a level of, of ambition and, and you, you look at the next step up or the one beyond that and you think, how do I get that far? How do I break through this, uh, the, this barrier, uh, which so few communication people seem to? I mean, the good news is that, that there are some exceptions. I can't think of many. I mean, the, the senior Etheridge, who's uh, chief executive of Harringay, I think Zena was a, a career communication specialist. Uh, Polly Chock at Hackney is now a full director with responsibility for all sorts of things, as well as comms, including arts and culture for, for, for Hackney, which is, of course, pretty cutting edge. Uh, and there's Lorraine Langham, who's at, at chief exec level. I worked for, for Lorraine when she was chief operating officer uh, at Brent, uh, but again, another career comms professional who's broken through to that absolute highest level. If you ask me to name a fourth one, I'd struggle. <laughs> uh, so it is one of those things where, where we, it does seem to be the exception more than the rule. And of course, no one, no one deserves endless promotions. You have to earn them and you have to be in the right position. But why is it for, uh, for, for us as a profession that we seem to have found so few people moving from head or director of communications onto whatever the next level is? Because it's really not uncommon. I mean, I've, I've worked in local authorities now for, for ooh, um, 14 years, uh, and it's not uncommon to find, say, a director of corporate services uh, who was either an HR professional or a lawyer or uh, an accountant. Um, more often, you'll also find someone who's come up through being head of policy and strategy or performance. Uh, but very rarely will you find someone who's been head of communications and then gets to, 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 to um, take the position that their boss used to have. Because I, I think there's something about what we do that we're maybe the flighty creative types. We suffer from this stereotype uh, and actually the lived experience where we sit around a table giving our professional advice and every single more senior person around the table than us thinks they know our job better than us whereas they would never dream of that the other way around. So, so we as a profession, we've long suffered from not having the parity of esteem that lawyers or architects or engineers or environmental health people have, where their specialism is generally recognised, the training, the experience, the, the years, the decades of experience they've had. Um, it, it's so often taken for granted for us because our bosses, well, they, they turn on the TV, so they know how the news works. Uh, so I think a, a chunk of it is about um, sometimes we're just not regarded as a proper profession. So when uh, the people are looking to, the people on appointments panels are looking to shortlist and then appoint to people who are going to be in charge of things that are um, full of professionals, they'll often think, well, a comms person, are they really a profession i'm not sure they do this this consciously but subconsciously i think there's some little voice in the back of the head saying they're not really a professional they're, they're, they're just the amateurs who, who, uh, who talk a lot who talk a good game it's not a real skill um and that's the challenge so, isn't it? Uh, and they, they, they think we're jack of all trades yeah. don't they 
that, that's that's the challenge when you're in college yeah. they think you're jack of all trades you know you're you're master of none um but i mean you you have i mean you've mentioned a few already you know some people have made it uh to like yourself to to areas who are covering other service areas um do you think that as comms people um that's a challenge for us to take on these other service areas or do you know because we are jack of all trades actually it's not a challenge what's your opinion on that I think it's the same challenge for anyone who gets to the level where they get to, in their organisation, however big or small and however high or not high that is, once they get to being the head of profession uh, for whatever it is, in our case, comms, and then they want to take one more step, they ended up managing the head of professions for five different professions. So you might have a director of community services who is responsible for housing, for environment, for planning, for... Uh, trading standards. They will probably come up through one of those routes, but they will have no idea how to answer the technical legal questions about all those other professions. And yet they're trusted because they've, they've demonstrated that the head of level, the head of whatever their profession is, they're trusted to, ha um, to develop the strategic skills to be able to manage a half dozen different professions. So sometimes I think that there's us in comms, we maybe don't trust ourselves how often do comms people apply for those next jobs? So is this a self-fulfilling prophecy? There aren't many of us who've got through because maybe there aren't many of us who thought we could get through and therefore who haven't applied. Or how much of it is lots of us are trying to get there but finding ourselves pushed back down. Uh, but honestly, the, the same challenge for us, imagine you're, you're an environmental health officer, rise to be head of environmental health, and then you want to be director of something, including all sorts of other things. How do you get the confidence to be able to manage a pile of people who are expert in their areas when you're not? You just have to take that leap of faith and trust that your strategic skills are what is being recruited to at that level. And actually, when it comes to, to strategic skills, I think we comms have a real advantage because we are at the absolute beating heart of the key decisions and the key problems of an organisation. Whereas if you're a, a, a head of education or a head of environmental health or a head of housing, you, you'll, you'll have your own share of problems and challenges in your own area, but you're not always at the centre of every big strategic challenge for the organisation because you're running your little bit of it. Whereas uh, if you're head of comms, then you're absolutely going to be at the centre of everything. So we actually have more of an opportunity to develop those, those strategic oversights uh, and insights that I think are really needed at that level. So, I mean, part of your background, however, um, not however, it's just probably the wrong word to use, but you've, you've been on both sides of the fence, really. So um, for, for many who don't know, um, you've been in local government for more than 25 years. You started off as a councillor and you was one of the youngest uh, leaders in the country. Um, so it's quite an achievement uh, to kind of, uh, you started off in London and Merton, and you're now up, up further up north um, in, in the level you are. So in those years, have you seen the kind of landscape change for senior comms people? Oh, it absolutely has. My, my first comms job in local government was in 2005. I landed the job in Newcastle as Director of Communication and Marketing. And it's not all about money, but in 2005, I earned £75,000 as Director of Comms and Marketing at Newcastle City Council. Today, I saw an advert for the Head of Comms for Sheffield City Council, equivalent size job, basically the same job, paying low to mid-60s. So the number of well-paying jobs in communications in local government has absolutely rocketed downhill through those years of austerity when, when previously there were, I mean, in common with, with, with um, all sorts of other jobs, um, where there were bigger uh, upper tiers of management in, mm. in local authorities. As austerity has trimmed and trimmed and trimmed that down, there are fewer heads or directors of comms now at that level in the organisation, and they're pushed one, if not two, if not three or four tiers down. So uh, part of my, my career in the last, uh, my, my focus for my last eight years has been as an interim, where quite often I've gone into authorities where big authorities, not little one, big authorities, where the best paid communication person in the building would earn 40, 42, 45,000 pounds. And the organization would wonder why they're not getting a really um, strategic set of communication advice. Well, mm. it's because they stripped it out and decided to stop paying for it. Not that people on their way up in their career can't offer that advice, but they're generally less likely to have the, the experience and the confidence because 
however much we're we're um, we're, we're kind of uh, uh, not wearing ties anymore, local government is still pretty hierarchical. Where one of the first things that people around big decision making tables do is they look at your job title before they decide how seriously they're going to take you. And if you're a service manager for something and you're sitting around the table with executive directors for this, that, and the other, they might ask you advice. Um, if they respect you as a professional and you can earn that but actually there's that there's that point where well you're not really one of us so we'll tell you what why don't you come to our senior management team we'll give you a five minute slot at agenda item 11 uh, and we'll expect you to uh, to be really strategic when you're not there through the whole thing um, to be able to say I tell you what instead of just bringing me in or debriefing me afterwards on what these big strategic decisions are that you've taken and then tell me to go and put a brave face on it. Why don't you let me advise you the right direction to go in in the first Have me in the room. The councils have taken the person out of the room, pushed them down, uh, made it a more junior post, and then wonder why they're not getting uh, what, what they really uh, aspire to. So we've made a rod for our own bats, understandably, uh, in local authorities, understandably because of, of austerity, but nonetheless, it's still a real problem so that I would say is uh, the biggest shift in the landscape I've noticed and, I've, and I have seen that I mean I've been working in local government quite a few years as well and um, I have seen that across across the piece although I think a lot of London councils have probably uh, understood the value of, of strategic communications um, but I have seen it in other places where they've devalued the post and then complain when they don't get the advice that they need so what do you think is the kind of solution around that um, and before before you answer that question just another observation I wonder whether as part of that solution that answer is whether Covid has made a difference because I'm feeling they're depending more on comms people than ever before. There's nothing good about Covid but you're right if, if this uh, if this pandemic doesn't give us the evidence to be able to show our absolute centrality to the organisation. I don't know what would. I mean, with that said, sometimes comms people during the coronavirus, they've been pulled in and given lots of tactical work. So I think our hard work has been valued. Whether or not our strategic nous has been fully demonstrated through it or valued, the jury may still be out. But, but your broader question, what do we do about it? I think we need to advocate on behalf of our profession I think we need to do a serious bit of work with the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, so SOLIS for, for, for England, with the LGA as well. We've got such great allies in the LGA. Um, uh, David Holstock and, and his team are just absolute champions in terms of professional practice, but also in terms of being cheerleaders for us as a profession. So we've got the allies within the LGA. And between us, I think through PRCA, CIPR, whoever, LG comms, we need to be doing even more to try and advocate directly with Solace and you know it's it, Solace's annual conferences where you can since I got to be at the, the lofty heights of assistant chief executive I actually get to join Solace so I'm going to do my best a little bit from the inside to try and prod all of the these uh, the senior ranks in local government to um, to recognize a little bit more what they could get or if anything potentially even challenge them show them here's what there isn't a one size fits all, but here are the kinds of things that if you want a strategic comms function, it can do for you. So here are some of the questions to ask. Do you get this from your comms function? And if not, here are maybe half a dozen reasons why you don't. One of which is, well, have you underinvested in it, both in terms of scale and in terms of, of the seniority and the experience and the access you give to your best paid comms person, whatever you end up calling the job title in your organisation. So one of those key questions would be, um, I'm imagining this now as, 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 as a bit of a kind of Hello Magazine style quiz, you know. Um, do you let your comms person either A, uh, into your senior management team start to finish, B, come along for, for five to ten minutes for, for agenda item 11, or C, debrief them via someone who isn't a comms expert? Uh, anyone who answers all the A's is probably in this position. Anyone who answers all the C's deserves what they're getting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um... No, it's really interesting. It's quite nice to have um, some of two hats in Solis, so uh, comms hat and the uh, chief exec hat uh, flying the flag. Um, obviously, the world is rapidly changing, and you know, back to the kind of change question with a slightly different angle. We've seen uh, the challenge for comms experts change, or whether we call us experts, it's a different question entirely. But um, the world has changed, and we have to change with it. So, what do you see are the challenges around that? 
Oh, you're absolutely right. I remember in uh, 2006, 7, 8, having conversations with the comms team I led at the time. When I got there, it was called the press office, of course, Jane. Is, uh, how dated it was about social media and having these hardened people, press officers, uh, most of whom are ex journalists, say to me, Nah, mate, social media, it's for the kids, it's not for us professionals. Uh, we deal with journalists. Uh, uh, and, and I remember saying to them at the time, Look, me as well as you, if we don't get our heads around social media in five years, we're not going to be employable. And to start with, it was dragging them, kicking and screaming before they embraced it. And, and they saw that I wouldn't pretend I was a pioneer, but I was an early adopter because I saw that uh, social media, if we didn't get our head around it, we wouldn't be fully employable. Uh, and we wouldn't be as effective and productive and we just wouldn't keep track. The equivalent today is artificial intelligence. Uh, AI and PR, personally, I'm nowhere on it, but I know I need to be somewhere on it or else within one or two years, I'm not gonna be employable. Now, what, one example of quite how all pervasive AI is now, I mean, it's not in our sector, but uh, you know, uh, Associated Press, uh, Press Association, now publishes 15 times more quarterly um, earnings reports from listed companies than they did a couple of years ago. They have not employed any extra journalists. The quarterly financial returns reports, 15 times more of them are written by an AI algorithm. So if I were, if you and I were, were, were in the field of uh, financial PR, we would find ourselves out on our ear pretty quickly because we wouldn't be selling our quarterly earnings reports into journalists. We'd be having to work out how the hell to sell them into an algorithm that isn't going to pick up the phone and have a conversation with us. We need a completely different set of skills to try and get our story into one of these, um, these massive growth areas, 15 times more. Um, quarterly earnings reports published by Press Association than they did before. I don't know what the equivalent's going to be from local government, but it's probably, probably only a year or two away. It'd be like you and me, we cut our teeth, picking up the phones, finessing conversations with journalists, grabbing them at the back of a council chamber and telling them what they've just heard. The bit that they thought was sexy wasn't the bit that was sexy at all. It was this other nice little bit that we want to draw their, their attention to. Look at the shiny thing over here. That's what we did. But that ain't going to work with an AI algorithm. So um, the biggest individual single challenge, I think, is AI. And I don't know um, in exactly what format that's going to challenge us in local government. But a, a second challenge is around um, you know, the death of local news, the paucity of journalists. You know, More and more of them are just losing their jobs. They're being rolled up into titles. Uh, and instead of journalism, we're having more polemics. Uh, I... I, I when I was in Cornwall Council, this, this is a reflection on the council at all, council there is great, um, I had this huge row with a local paper when on their, um, their website and their social media feeds, they, they had a go at Cornwall Council because there was traffic chaos and I can't remember the name of the town. Uh, there was no warning, the road just got dug up and there was traffic chaos because it was a main road. Uh, so lots of people were having a go at the council and then the local paper joined in. As soon as we hear about this, get to the bottom of this, we find out that the road had been dug up by a statutory undertaker, as those of us in local government call them, one of those, those agencies that has permission to dig the roads up, you know, the gas, the electricity, the water, the, the telecoms. I, I think it was a telecom firm. Telecom people had broken the rules, turned up without any notice to us or anyone else, without any advance warning, without any signs, they just started digging up the road and caused traffic chaos. As soon as we went back and told the local paper that the story, the truth, because we're not allowed to not tell the truth, and it happened to, to actually be the unvarnished truth, that we were as annoyed as everyone else was. It wasn't us who dug up the road or given permission to dig up the road without warning. Um, it was this statutory undertaker, the, the telecoms people. The local paper argued back. They actually said to me, I actually had a conversation with an editor who said to me, all we're doing is reporting that the public is outraged on social media with the council. It is accurate to say the public is outraged with um, on social media with the council for this road being deep dug up. We understand it's not your fault, but we're just accurately reporting what the public's saying. And you have got no interest whatsoever in actually telling the truth. Uh, because we, we, we've, we've, uh, they haven't got any journalists left, they haven't got any time, it was getting lots of clickbait and traffic. Therefore, as far as he was concerned, it was a success because it was driving ad revenue. Um, and we're in that world now, and lots of journalists and editors have got better standards than that, but we're in the world where that's not a unique story, and that's really worrying too. It is, it is a challenging world, and, you know, the days of being able to pick up a bunch of journalists doesn't, isn't really there anymore because there's only about three of them left 
Um, and quite often the paper isn't made in the same place as where the journalist sits either. So it's quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to see how AI does affect our futures. I mean, one of, I think one of the other challenges personally knocking around is uh, misinformation, disinformation. Back to your point about, you know, people uh, they're describing as people being outraged and actually it wasn't the council. And, you know, and I think COVID has made that even worse. Um, recently managing misinformation, misinformation, disinformation. So, I, you know, personally, I see that as a challenge for us. Um, I, but another challenge I would suggest, and I wonder what your opinion is on this, and, and I think we'll draw it to a close off this, is, um, is obviously we all work in pressurised environments. Many of us are working from home at the moment. So there's, there's a completely different type of pressure now around isolation, maybe, or, or other factors. But... Um, uh, the other thing also, I'm sure many of you were, Saturday was uh, Internet, International Mental Health Day, World Mental Health Day, sorry. Um, so I just wondered what, what do you do about, what's your advice around building resilience, personal resilience, handling those pressurised environments? What, what do you do? Uh, John, I think everyone's got their, their own coping strategy. And, and to some degree, I, I think what the coronavirus is showing up is that the introverts of the world are actually getting on a little bit better than the extroverts because, uh, because the, us natural introverts, I count myself amongst them, uh, are better able to cope with our own company and don't need to be surrounded by people all the time because we get enough of that five days a week or more um, talking to people on Zoom and Teams. But... Um, so how much you need to cope, I think, for, 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 for starting point is, is, is depend how much company you need in the first place. And I'm one of those people, I, I've, uh, I, I live alone. So I, I have not physically touched another person for about six or seven months. And it's a, a wee bit bloody weird. Mm. Uh, but coping strategies, do you know what? I, I developed more coping strategies as a manager. And the one thing someone else told me this and I tried it was to... Um, individually in one-to-one conversations with my staff ask them three times how they are if you ask someone how they are and you get their well rehearsed answer i'm fine thanks or whatever it is you ask them a second time this is all journalistic trick you ask them a second time and ask them not to use the same words and you deploy the pregnant pause whilst they think hold on you just asked me that and most times people don't want to give you the same answer so they'll, they'll, they'll stop and think oh he's actually asked me a question he wants to know more what my answer is and when you ask, when I've done this and I've asked people a third time, by the third time, they were either at one end of the spectrum laughing maniacally that at the irony of it because they can see what I'm doing uh, and that they, they, they really are, you know, um, a, a bit manic. Or they're in floods of tears. I mean, not everyone, that's a spectrum and some people are uh, someplace in between. But as a manager, the biggest tip I got from someone else that I would share is ask your staff, look them in the eye three times and keep on going until you think you're actually getting the honest answer about how they are. Because once you've got to that point of manic laughter at one end of the spectrum or floods of tears at the other, you might actually be in a position to try and do something about it. Great. Well, well thank you very much, Peter. It's uh, been really nice talking to you. Really interesting to hear about your, uh, your views. And um, I suppose, is there any kind of parting thought you might want to give someone around in making it up that the food chain, if you like, uh, you know, something they, they should be doing or working harder. What, what would be your kind of last final parting call? Yeah. Uh, comms adjacent activities. So on my way, uh, when I've been in permanent roles, uh, first year or two, I've tried to make a real positive impact focusing on exactly what the day job is and then make yourself valuable. So the chief exec gives you some other bit of the organisation that needs a bit of help or fixing. So in a comms adjacent role, might be customer services policy, might be consultation and engagement if you haven't already got that in your remit, might be arts and culture, festivals and events, tourism, it could be democratic services or scrutiny, it could be elections because we're always at the heart of those. Uh, I, I, at the moment, I'm actually a deputy monitoring officer, one of those people who, who often gives comms people lots of grief by saying, you can't say that, you know, I'm, I'm now the person whose job it is to say, you can't say that, you know. Um, so find comms adjacent activities in your organisation where you can add value. Uh, and by taking those on, I, I never expected and didn't ever get a pay rise or change in, in job title but what I got was the trust of the organization one to be able to problem solve and secondly to be able to show that I was working across disciplines that were not my discipline 
and to operate at a strategic level. So if you want to make those small steps to prove your worth within your own organization so you can go for a permanent promotion in your own organization or even externally, see what these little comms adjacent additional pieces of work you can find that you can use your skill set and grow your skill set on. Brilliant. Great. Well, thank you much, Peter. Thank you for joining thank you. us. And it's been really good talking to you.